Tonight we are hosting um, the Neuro-Oncology Nursing Update. Our first speaker uh, will be Dr. Jacob Young, who is a six-year neurosurgery resident here at UCSF, who many of you know. Um, Jake has an interest in neurosurgical oncology and immunotherapy. His translational research focuses on investigating novel viral and immuno immunological agents uh, for the treatment of high-grade gliomas, and his clinical research explores how to optimize functional outcomes and minimize complications after surgery for brain tumors. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Young. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today. It's uh, truly an honor to be here for this. I think this is a remarkable uh, event. I haven't ever seen anything quite like this before. And I'm excited to get a chance to represent the neurosurgical side of things in this conversation. So I'm going to talk today about some updates that we're using in the operating room to try to make these surgeries as safe as we possibly can. And then some updates on the imaging side of things for how we know if the treatments we're using are working and when we should consider reoperating for these tumors. I wouldn't have the chance to talk to you today if I didn't have amazing mentorship here at UCSF. So I want to make sure that I acknowledge all of our neurosurgical oncologists because they've taught me a great deal about these procedures. And it's sort of humbling to admit, but I think surgery is never going to be enough for these diseases. I think for patients with glioblastoma, the operating room alone will never be curative. This is a paper almost 100 years old now from Walter Dandy, who's one of the fathers of neurosurgery, way before MRI scans, way before CT scans. If patients were hemiplegic, they would just take that entire hemisphere out because they didn't know exactly where the tumor was. And unfortunately, the tumors would still come back on the other side. So I think we know being extremely aggressive in the operating room is still not going to cure patients of this disease. This cartoon comes from uh, basically the year I was born or a year <laughs> afterwards. But um, I like it because it shows that there's still tumor cells migrating in this invasive disease way beyond the contrast-enhancing portion of the tumor way beyond the flare abnormal portion of the tumor on the MRI, and even to the other side of the, the healthy appearing brain. Although it's a much lower percentage, I think this explains why we're never going to cure this disease with surgery alone. So that begs the question, what's our goal in the operating room? And fortunately, there have been major guidelines put out by the largest oncology societies in both the US and in Europe, the Society for Neuro-Oncology, the European Association of Neuro-Oncologists, the American Society of Clinical Oncologists, looking at IDH wild-type tumors, IDH mutant tumors, basically the entire spectra of gliomas. And the bottom line is we should be doing a maximal safe surgical resection. Those are sort of the words that you hear over and over again, a maximal safe surgical resection, which is great. But then it begs the question, what does a maximal safe or surgical resection mean? And I was really fortunate when I was a junior resident to be a part of this study that we published a few years ago that looked at sort of changing the paradigm for what a maximal safe surgical resection means for patients with glioblastoma. Outlined in red, you can see is a contrast enhancing portion of a tumor. And we used to think about taking out all of the contrast enhancing tumor as a gross total resection as the words that would be used. It turns out Unsurprisingly, if you think back to that cartoon a few slides ago, that there are some tumor cells that extend into that yellow outlined region of flare signal abnormality. And in this study, we looked at if there was a benefit to going into the flare portions of the disease and trying to be even more aggressive and take more of those tumor cells out. This is a relatively uh, complex sort of statistical analysis called a recursive partitioning analysis. But the take home message is that in order for patients to do the best, to end up in that group four line, we needed to change our goals. And instead of just trying to take out the red portion of the disease, we focused on going into the yellow flare portion of the disease, which we're calling a supermaximal resection. So taking out even more is beneficial. We're learning more and more about the genetics of these tumors, and the definition is always changing. And in that paper, which we published in 2020, it's already a little bit outdated because the definition of tumors has changed, and now certain mutations no longer allow you to have a glioblastoma. We're lucky at UCSF to be a major center and collaborate with a lot of other major oncology centers around the world. And this was a paper that we published earlier this year with 12 centers around the world in this Reno-Resect Consortium 
where we restricted the definition of glioblastoma to only those patients that had IDH wild type tumors, which is now what the World Health Organization considers to be a glioblastoma. And fortunately, we found very similar results where being even more aggressive is beneficial than just going after the contrast enhancing portion of the disease. And these little tables show that we really need to be quite aggressive. We need to get about 60% of the flare disease out in order for patients to have a benefit, or we need to try to leave as little as less than five cubic centimeters of uh, tissue remaining after surgery. For the low-grade tumors, we see a very similar story. This paper actually isn't even out yet, but is going to uh, be published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology any day now. And for the low-grade tumors, going beyond the flare seems to produce a survival benefit. You'll notice that the total time and years for these tumors, we're looking at 15 years on the x-axis. So this is a much longer time frame than for the glioblastoma tumors. And we're learning more and more about the genetics of these tumors as well. And if you separate the astrocytomas from the oligodendrogliomas, you'll see that the gross total resection and supertotal resections are splitting in the astrocytoma group, suggesting we really need to be going for those extra aggressive resections. The oligodendroglioma group hasn't even hit the 50% survival yet, and we're out to almost 20 years. So it remains to be seen if being extra aggressive in oligodendrogliomas will hold the same benefit that it does with astrocytomas. But for now, what I hope those papers suggest is that the definition of an aggressive resection is changing, and we're no longer talking about doing gross total resections, which means we're taking out all of the very abnormal tissue that we can see. We're talking about doing super total or super maximal resections, where we're going into either the flare or even the normal appearing brain for the low grade tumors. However, when we get more aggressive, we have to be mindful that we're more likely to cause deficits. This uh, sort of tree, recursive tree that you see in the bottom of the slide is the exact same data that we used in that first paper that was published in JAMA Oncology with the, the glioblastoma tumors. But now we imputed into the analysis, what if patients had a neurological deficit after surgery? And you can see the very first branch in the tree is deficit or no deficit. And the only way you can possibly end up in the best survival line, that orange red line, is if you don't have a neurological deficit. And it turns out that motor deficits are more impactful than any other type of deficit. That doesn't mean that language deficits and visual deficits aren't impairing quality of life, but a motor deficit is absolutely gonna change the patient's prognosis. And so we need to think about what surgical adjuncts we can use in the operating room to be aggressive, but to be as safe as possible when we do it. And now I'm going to transition to some of the techniques that we actually use in the operating room to help us avoid those deficits that can be so harmful to our patients. This is a landmark paper published by many of the uh, luminaries in the neurosurgical oncology uh, led by Dr. Berger here at UCSF that suggested that we needed to use mapping in the operating room to minimize deficits. This was a meta-analysis, it's 10 years old now. It showed that you could take the deficit rate from 8% to 3% if you did stimulation mapping, meaning we were trying to find function in the operating room. And because this is 10 years old, they were talking about gross total resections rather than super total resections, but you can see an increase in the gross total resection rate with stimulation mapping. We're actually in the process of updating this because now we use a lot of different types of mapping rather than just on the cortex of the brain, we're doing subcortical mapping as well. And we're interested in looking at other outcomes beyond just deficit rates and gross total resection rates. So the same group of collaborators has gotten together and we're gonna update this paper next year. We've talked a lot, um, or we've written a lot at UCSF about how we actually do these procedures. And I think it's a, uh, the technical details are a little bit in the weeds for this talk, but we always want to think about what type of task we want to ask the patients to do. When you're in the operating room and they have a little bit of anesthesia on board, you don't have the ability to test every possible thing you could ever think of. You need to be very focused and tailored with what you're going to test and how you're going to test it. We also set up the room in such a way that we can fit quite a few people in the operating room without it being distracting or dangerous to the patient. And so we've written about even how you set up the room so you can have the computer screen that the patient can see. You can have neurologists to ensure you're not inducing a seizure. You can have uh, you know, the scrub team handing the surgeons the equipment they need. It's sort of a, a very um, 
choreographed dance that has to take place in order for it to be done efficiently and safely. And we've really been interested in how we can do motor mapping asleep as safe as we do it in the awake setting. And so we've recently published a lot on the different techniques that we can use to, to identify where the motor system is in asleep patients in the exact same level of sensitivity that we get in the awake patients because we're really trying to avoid those motor deficits. This is a little video of how we do the subcortical language mapping. And this is an Ogeman stimulator in the left hand and a Cavitron in the right hand. And what we're doing is we're looking for these tracks, these long white fibers that carry information from one region of the brain to another to try to make sure we're not transecting those tracks in the process of the resection. And we might be using any of those tasks that you see on the left side of the screen. The workhorse is picture naming, where we show a picture and ask the patient to say what it is. But things like reading are critical depending on where in the, in the brain we're working on. This is a little bit more information on the, the motor mapping. Um, really the advance I think in the last six or seven years that has made this much, much safer and able to be done in patients while they're asleep is the use of this monopolar stimulator. And what that allows us to do is actually get a distance with how far away from the tract we are. That graph on the bottom left of the slide shows that it's about a one millimeter to one milliamp relationship between the tract and the stimulator. So we, we can put the stimulator into the resection and we ask our uh, electrophysiologist to increase the amplitude. And if they find the tract at eight milliamps, we know we're about eight millimeters away. And with the bipolar stimulator, it's more of a yes or no, are you near function or not? And it sometimes gives us a little warning too late. So we really like this monopolar stimulator for identifying how close we are to the tracks and we can inch our way or more like millimeter our way to where the tracks are. We use DTI, which is a very um, beautiful way of visualizing these long white matter tracks in the brain to help us know when we should map. And so this uh, on the left is a, is a bunch of different uh, long tracks that are useful in the operating room. This magenta blue, which I hope you can see is the corticospinal tract, so that controls movement. A lot of these other tracks are important for the language pathways and they wrap around the sylvian fissure, which is this uh, fissure between the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. And we use these in the operating room and we use them on our imaging studies, both before and after surgery, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the second half of the talk. But they can help us predict when patients do have problems, how likely are they to recover. And here you can see um, on the preoperative scans, this is a tumor in the bottom of the temporal lobe. And there was this tract, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus running right on top of the tumor. This is a mathematical projection. So obviously uh, we don't get the luxury in the operating room of the tracks lighting up in different colors for us. But um, after the surgery, unfortunately the resection probably clipped the bottom part of that long tract, and this patient had trouble recognizing faces, which is an interesting deficit. But um, we use this in the operating room every single tumor resection to help us guide when we should start to apply the mapping. I'm not going to play this uh, video but um, because I'm, I'm not sure it's going to work, but we use navigation in the operating room. It's like a GPS signal, and you can see this is the the patient's uh, tumor, and with this probe registered to the MRI scan, we can place the probe where we're working, and it will move the MRI scan to show us exactly where we are. And they do project those tracks on the MRI scan, and they are nicely colored, so we can try to you know, uh, recognize when we're getting close to something like the motor system and start to map it again. And so for every case, we use neuronavigation to help guide us during the resection. But I do just wanna make the point, I think even in the surgical community, some people think that those tracks are gospel and what they show is 100% accurate, but they're actually just mathematical projections based on how the MRI scan is obtained. And these are a series of different reasons why you can't necessarily trust everything that you see on those tracks. If you put the region of interest for the track in a slightly different place, you get a very different projection. 
Tumors have swelling around them and they can be black out areas for the tracks. In the operating room, as the brain shifts because we're doing the resection, the tracks will shift away and it may not be in a one-to-one -one, um, sort of relationship. And then the actual program that you use to calculate the track is gonna change how it looks. So I just wanna make the point that we don't think of these tracks as necessarily representing function. They're more like roadmaps for when we need to start mapping again so that we can truly localize where these eloquent regions are and we don't wanna cause any damages. The other thing that I think has really advanced in the operating room in my six years as a resident is how we identify tumor margins during surgery. I'm gonna talk about a series of these techniques in the next few slides, but we can give patients uh, a fluorescent dye that they drink in the preoperative area called aminolevulonic acid. And for those of you who help take care of our patients in the ICU afterwards, these patients need to have low light precautions because that um, compound can make patients very photosensitive. But it's almost like a tumor paint where it can light up the tumor cells under a blue fluorescent light. And so we look through the microscope, which we always use for these types of tumors, and we can change the wavelength of light. So instead of seeing a normal clear light, we see a blue light wavelength, and it will show this very bright pink of where the tumor cells are. We can also use the ultrasound. You can see that on the bottom um, image uh, on the illustration, which is a real-time assessment of any areas of residual tumor. It's one of the few uh, real-time options we have in the operating room for looking at residual tumor. Occasionally, we'll do intraoperative MRI scans where we'll quickly close the skin and get an MRI scan to see if there's any areas of residual tumor before either fo fully closing or opening it back up and, and finishing the resection. The technology that we're really excited about at UCSF is Raman spectroscopy. Um, this is uh, a rapid, uh, basically what the pathologists tell us in 20 to 30 minutes. This machine can tell us in about two to three minutes. So we take a small piece of tissue, we hand it to the uh, technologists in the operating room, and within two minutes they can tell us if they see any tumor cells or not on the tissue. It allows you to almost do a Mohs surgery type resection in the brain where you can go layer by layer and see if you're still getting tumor cells or not, which isn't feasible if you're taking a, a specimen and sending it to pathology. You may have to wait 30 minutes before they give you an answer. And their answer is usually a yes or no, whereas this machine will give you a quantitative value of how dense the tumor cells are in the region. So we're using it to try to identify different margins in the tumor. And uh, we're really excited about that technology moving forward. This is that tumor paint. This was a landmark paper that showed that patients did better when you use the tumor paint for high grade tumors or glioblastomas. Uh, and patients just drink a small amount of liquid in the preoperative area. And then when we turn the blue light on the microscope, you can see this kind of bright pink region is an area of tumor that still needs to be removed. It's not perfect. There are some things that light up that aren't tumor, and there are some tumors that don't light up, but it's a, it's a great um, sort of a adjunct or assistant in the operating room when you're, you think you're close to finishing the resection. It's a, it's a good tool to use. This is that intraoperative MRI um, where occasionally, if we think there might be a, a small amount of tumor on one border and we're not sure, you can get an MRI scan immediately. It does take a bit of time, uh, and it's not as high quality as the MRIs that we're typically getting on the patients either in the clinic or in the hospital after surgery, but it is something that can be used to try to improve our extent of resection and try to, try to make sure we know when to stop. The ultrasound is uh, sort of shades of gray, but it allows us to, to put the probe on the brain and in real time get feedback for what's underneath the probe. And so that MRI that we use to navigate on, it doesn't update. It was obtained the day before surgery. As you start to remove all the tumor, your MRI doesn't look any different. It was obtained the day before surgery. The ultrasound is real-time feedback, uh, and it's extremely useful for very small tumors that you might not be seeing as obviously as you can see the very big tumors. And so we really like to use the ultrasound for our smaller or deeper-seated tumors, or at the end of a resection, if you think that you're at the end, but you put the ultrasound in and you see this little area of denser tissue that actually is a, is a clue to look at it again and see if there's any tumor remaining. 
The last adjunct that I wanted to talk about is something called uh, the laser induced thermal therapy or LIT. And this is a technique where we can insert uh, a thermal electrode that can basically uh, heat up to you know, 40 or higher Celsius and uh, cause a thermal injury in the tumor cells. It's actually not something that we use often here at UCSF, but for very deep seated tumors, it might be a, a good uh, technology to try to make these as safe as possible, where you would insert the electrode or the thermal probe into the tumor and then burn the tissue in the surrounding region. Um, and it's something that's being explored around the country as a possible treatment option for these tumors. But I do want to make the point that as we push resections to the brink, there will be some patients with post-operative deficits, and we really need to explore interventions to accelerate their recovery. And I think as surgeons, we haven't done a great job of recognizing and addressing the mental health impact of both the diagnosis and potentially neurological deficits after surgery. So I just want to talk about two active or soon-to-be-launched trials that we're launching here that I think are going to be really beneficial for our patients. The first is a way of accelerating recovery. And I can't remember where I heard this, but someone once said that a post-operative MRI, it's like a painting in a museum. You can see it, but you can't touch it. And this is a picture of someone who has a very small ischemic injury. The red arrow is pointing to this darker region on this type of MRI scan that indicates ischemia. And this white tract is that corticospinal tract, the motor tract. And so this patient had weakness after surgery. And looking at this MRI, we might be able to talk to the patients about why we think they have the deficit, um, but we can't do too many things to improve it. It turns out that there's a technology called transcranial magnetic stimulation that's a non-invasive way of trying to alter the, the brain connectivity and, and um, you can actually stimulate the motor tracks. And if you do this repetitively, you can induce plasticity or the ability to learn in the brain. There was a group in Europe that utilized this in patients after surgery who had weakness. But in, in this German group, those patients stayed in the hospital for six to eight weeks after surgery. And they had this stimulation every single day before their rehabilitation. In the US, that's not really possible. Patients typically go to acute rehab centers or skilled nursing facilities. And so what we've tried to do is partner with our um, colleagues in physical therapy and occupational therapy, and we're delivering this repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation every day right before they start therapy for the duration of their hospital stay. So it may only be four days or five days, much shorter than they used in the German group, but we're trying to see if this is feasible to incorporate to the U.S. healthcare system. And if it is, we might be able to get some of these machines at the rehab facilities or work on bringing patients back and forth. Um, so I'm pretty excited about this technology uh, moving forward. The last thing is starting to recognize the behavioral health and mental health impact of these, uh, these diagnoses on patients. Uh, we recently looked at um, the literature and, and wrote a systematic review on some of the, um, the symptoms and conditions that patients have with anxiety and depression and despair and PTSD around their diagnosis. And uh, these aren't static conditions. They change every single scan, every single visit, if there's progression, another surgery is needed. And um, I think this is actually one of the few opportunities where telemedicine might have a very valuable role in taking care of these patients. Rather than adding a visit to another provider when they're already either in the middle of a treatment plan that requires weekly visits or um, traveling far distances to see their neuro-oncology team, um, this might be an opportunity for telehealth to, to make a big impact. And so we've been working on a a clinical trial protocol. Uh, Dr. Chang's been helping with this, and we recently got IRB approval. So we're hoping to start enrolling patients into a feasibility study to see if we can incorporate telehealth counseling for our patients around the time of surgery. So the last part of this is going to be talking a little bit about imaging updates and how we know if our therapies are working or if they're not working. Um, very quickly, I think most people are familiar with the standard of care for these high-grade tumors, which involve lots of radiation treatments and, and chemotherapy, a temozolomide treatment. Um, but there can be problems determining if patients are responding to their therapy or are failing to respond to their therapy. Um, and this is a, is a big challenge because if you want to change treatments or continue treatment, is very dependent on the scans that patients receive. 
I'm going to talk a little bit more about the MRI scan qualities that we're using now to try to try to guide this decision. But um, in this paper that's now um, over a decade old, uh, written by the neuro-oncology team here, you'll see that between a third and a half of patients will have some changes on their immediate scan after radiation therapy. Uh, or sorry, half of patients have some change on their immediate scan after therapy. And of those, about half are going to stabilize and improve. So we don't want to make a change every time we see uh, a concerning or new finding on an MRI scan. There have been guidelines to try to help us determine when uh, a scan is demonstrating disease progression. I know this is too small for you to read, but the Reno group, the same one that we're working with to update uh, some of the guidelines around surgery, they're a radiographic assessment in neuro-oncology is what Reno stands for, and they've, a, they've put forth very spe specific criteria for what counts as progression and what doesn't. But um, I think the point that I'd like to make is the conventional imaging is, is not enough to determine if patients have disease progression or not. On the top, you see what we call pseudoprogression or patients that are actually responding to treatment, but it looks like they're progressing. And on the bottom, you see viable tumor or true progression. And both the T1 with contrast the flare MRIs, they all show mass effect, they show edema, they show contrast enhancement. So we can't rely on these conventional MRI techniques to, to completely answer the question. And we're starting to look at multiple invasive and non-invasive ways of determining tumor recurrence, including metabolic imaging and more um, machine learning and uh, mathematical models to assess MRI scans, and then a few where surgeons can be involved, like obtaining more tissue and looking at liquid biopsies or, or looking for markers in the blood and the CSF to try to determine if the tumor is recurring. So uh, this is an example of the types of MRI scans that we can look at, um, where you can look at either a physiologic parameter like blood flow, or you can look at uh, a metabolite like uptake of certain PET tracers to try to determine if there's progression or treatment-related changes. Um, and these are things that we're getting much more commonly on our patients at UCSF when we're trying to make a decision for should we continue with therapy or should we change course and consider alternative treatments. One of the uh, technologies that I think is um, being used a little bit more often now is something called a FET-PET scan, which is a scan that is um, useful in distinguishing between those treatment-related changes and true tumor progression. And it usually only lights up uh, in patients that have active tumor present. And so if there's an MRI scan with some concerning features, we might be getting these FET-PET scans to look to see if there's a true disease recurrence or not. Radiomics hasn't quite made it into the standard of care for patients, but there's a lot of interest in looking at both quantitative assessments of the tumor shape or assessments of the uh, the blood flow uh, or where the tumor is changing to try to predict if it's true tumor progression um, or the treatment response. And I think we're going to be doing more and more of this in the future, looking for tumor, uh, tumor DNA that's circulating either in the blood or in the CSF. There's been some high-profile papers in neuro-oncology, which is sort of the premier journal for this field, looking at incorporating these these markers of, of tumor DNA in the course of uh, a patient's care. And one of the things that we can do as surgeons is insert uh, reservoirs that will allow us to easily access CSF to try to track these, uh, these markers of either tumor progression or, or tumor response. We're getting into the treatment portion, and I think Jen's going to go over a lot of that, so maybe I'll pause here. But if, uh, there's a lot of different options that we have, and I think Jen's going to go through them. So thank you. Thank you.